Whoop, there you go. Smallmouth. On today's show, we head down the river with one of our favorite fishy characters. His name oh, says it all. One. Don't miss a chance to fish with yeah. the grids. Oh, Freshwater <laughs> drum. Yeah. The people who made that decision. Jeopardy. And who's the top dog to talk about fishing in the state of Minnesota? How about Don Pereira? He's the new fisheries chief at the DNR. It's time to talk fishing. Uh, point three at five feet. And while we survived a brutal winter this year unscathed, keep in mind that many of our favorite lakes across the state will not be the same. Find out about winter kill. And later in our Minnesota Bound Classic, we head to the woods with a fella morel mushroom hunter known as Digger. We just ain't seeing him yet, but I can smell him. Those stories and more next. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers. Hi everybody, Raven and I welcome you to the show. You know, while most of Minnesota is waiting for the official walleye opener, walleyes are legal catches in the Mississippi River. And there's one guy who knows more about catching walleyes in the river or catching any fish in the Mississippi. He goes by the name of Grizz. If you've never before seen a real-life river rat, well, now you have. And the fun part about fishing on a river, you never know what you're going to pull up. He's also the most famous river rat in Minnesota. Meet the Grizz, short for... Dick Javinsky, Pollock. <laughs> I'm 71 and a half right now, so we're getting up there. To the Grizz, up there usually means the daily fish count kept on a hand clicker. Still have your clicker? There it is, the original. Oh, that's the original That's clicker. the one. Oh, well, we have walleyes uh, some days over 200 a day. It sounds like, you know, <laughs> but it's, it was true. Take me to the fish, Grizz. Yeah. <laughs> so it's nice about having a guide. I don't have to think. Yep. Yeah, just put the rod down and, well, do it. Finding fish close to home may explain why you'll often find the Grizz floating and fishing his favorite hangout, the old Mississippi, from St. Paul on down. Well, you're not gonna, you won't confuse this with wilderness, will you? <laughs> no, not up here. <laughs> with all the barges. So your dad and mom were your first fishing partners? I was in a boat when I was three months old and I was in a picnic basket. My mom and dad, and dad would row out there with their oars and fish, right. hook them right in the mouth. Yeah. Grizz like has that. one goal when he guides, catch fish. Whoop, there you go. Any kind of fish. Small mouth. Yeah. And catch a bunch. <laughs> that a boy, Ron. The right guy got him, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, fish right there. That one? Yeah. yeah that snap. That's fight, it might be a walleye. Chug at his head good. It ain't no sheephead. It's a serious fish. Oh, it is a sheephead. Is it? Oh my God, it's Great huge. big son of a gun. <laughs> huge sheephead. <laughs> Freshwater <laughs> drum. drum, yep. Maybe he was the head of the flock. Yeah, at the head of his. Grizz was convinced the big flock also included walleyes. Oh, that's a better fish. Oh, that's a... Oh, yeah, nice one. There we go. All right. Good one. Good one. Yeah. Boy, they're pretty fish, aren't they? Oh, yeah, they're beautiful on the river here. Decades of guiding with a passion yeah. for catching has made Grizz famous in angling circles and popular with his clients. I've always been honest with people. If the fish ain't biting, I tell them right out, I won't take it. Or, yeah. or you know, I, I never took anybody and say, oh, you should have been here yesterday. I've, you getting a little tough on your customers? Oh, yeah. No, I get crabby <laughs> after a while. I can't help it. <laughs> So if they go with you, you better be prepared for a little harassment unless oh, yeah, they, they listen to you. Oh, yeah. huh? well, I'm trying to help them, you know, and they, they don't listen, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Chew them look, out. Yep. Tell them the way it is. There we go. Hey, got one, run. Painting like a sheep head. And that's what it is, too. Yep. He talks to you. You talk back to him. I'm going to let you go, buddy. 
Thanks for the thanks for playing the game. A lot of people say, "What's your favorite fish?" I said, "The one that's on the end of my line." Got a fish? Yep. Got something. Yeah, fishing machines aren't choosy. It is it? Yeah, not a real big yeah. one. Walleye. Got him. Ah, that's a dandy. You like a wall? Ah, that's a sheephead. Oh, there he got one. <laughs> yeah. Good size? Yeah. Holy crap. Oh, it's, oh, it's a big old catfish. Yeah. Walleyes to catfish yeah. makes no difference to a river rat. <laughs> After 40 years of guiding around ugly scenery, but great fishing, the Grizz is still eager to spend another day with Old Man River. Till I can't go anymore, I guess. It's time to talk fishing, folks, and who better to sit down and talk with but the new DNR Fisheries Chief. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota Select GMC Dealers. Connecticut, Radco Truck Accessories, and by Starkey Hearing Technologies. You know, as we await the fishing season, the question we all have on our mind, what is the state of fishing in Minnesota? Well, there's only one guy who can answer that question. That's the DNR fisheries chief. He's new, his name, Don Pereira. We sat down and had a chat. When you ask how they bite and how's fishing in Minnesota, Don Pereira has the final answer. Well, I think overall it's very good. I mean, we, um, we've had some staggering success stories. Um, you know, whether it's recovery of sturgeon on the rainy system, um, we're doing great sturgeon restoration work throughout the Red River Basin now. That's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, we, we mentioned earlier that we've made um, some major headway and special regulations to improve, improve the quality of fishing as it relates to the opportunity to, for catching bigger fish. In November 2013, Don Pereira was named Minnesota's new DNR fisheries chief, taking over one of the hottest seats in state government. I don't necessarily know that I want a hot seat, but you know, it's been a great organization. For 30 years, Pereira was conducting fish research for DNR. I just feel like in, uh, research is a great place, it's intense, it's a lot of work, but I also felt a little bit sheltered in research as well. The new chief is sheltered no more. He now conducts a $30 million fisheries management program with some 290 employees for a fishing public that is huge. Roughly 30% of the state's population goes fishing every year. And you could say it's his job to shorten the time between bites. We ask Pereira, for his top three fishing issues. One, probably the biggest emerging one right, right now is Northern Pike. And we do know that we have an increasing trend in Northern Pike in some parts of the state. We do know that we have a decreasing trend in yellow perch, which is disconcerting. So we're gonna be putting a lot of energy into that. Number two will be habitat. How can we do it better and more efficient? A lot of it is, is working with new programs, um, like clean water, the Clean Water Fund. Uh, we have a strong collaboration between our staff and the Pollution Control Agency and helping to, uh, to help, help them execute their impaired water programs. So we're trying to be more targeted, more focused, more strategic in how we're doing acquisition as well. And the third issue is certainly Mille Lacs. It's, it's a very important lake. We need to get it fixed as quickly as possible. Of the three issues, the collapse of walleye fishing on Mille Lacs appears to be the most complex and the most controversial. The error that we made is we weren't paying attention to how fishing mortality was distributed across the entire walleye population. And some of our brightest biologists said, you know, you've got this slot limit, but you've got a lot of fish being killed in a pretty narrow size range. So are you creating this gauntlet of mortality, if you will? And we think that's to probably to blame for this 10-year decline in male abundance in walleyes. That so, was DNR's decision to do that. It was our decision, correct. Let me ask you this. The people who made that decision jeopardized the state's premier walleye fishery. Do they get fired? There was great 
consternation and, and tension between us and the consults, consultants of the bands. And we took, we took our management plan and we hired two independent nationally recognized fishery scientists. They looked at our system and they said, based on the uncertainty and based on the fact that you have no, that you have no previous experience managing the system, this seems like a reasonable place to start. So we started. One of the state's ecological issues is invasive species. I'm not losing sleep yet. We've had some of them around for a long time, and you know we seem to be coping with them okay. But we have some really nasty ones here: um, zebra mussels, spiny water flea. I think the sleepless nights might be in the future, but um, so far. Um, we haven't seen the dramatic negative impacts that, that could be happening. Next, how did your lake make it through this long winter? Many lakes experience something called winter kill. Find out more about it next. Closed captioning is brought to you by By the Yard, premier manufacturers of maintenance-free outdoor patio furniture and accessories from recycled plastic. Coming up, considering the severe winter we had in Minnesota, the question comes up, what about the fish? What is something called winter kill? Well, our Travis Frank has the story. In the land of 10,000 lakes, winters seldom come easy. After one of the worst on record, we don't need a reminder just how bad winter can get. But what happens when the snow, cold, and ice linger too long? For many of Minnesota's lakes, a phenomenon known as winter kill sets in. Simply put, a lake runs out of oxygen and the fish die. Winter kill is a natural, natural occurrence that happens when, especially when you get uh, you know, early ice and you get really thick ice and you get big heavy snowfalls on top, 33 inches. Of ice. Mother Nature obviously has, uh, she's got more of the say than, than I do. Joining Minnesota DNR biologist Joe Stewig, we set out to measure oxygen levels on a popular Minnesota lake. We're gonna go out and find one of the deeper holes. Uh, we'll drill a hole and we got our uh, dissolved oxygen meter and we'll start taking measurements uh, at different depth and intervals down to the bottom. Oh, there we go. So this is what actually picks up the oxygen. Yep, each of these are a foot. This lake is shallow, and for the past few months, thick Stick ice has there. supported more than two feet of snow. Stick this in. It's a deadly combination that prevents sunlight from reaching plants below. To support most game fish, a lake needs to hold an oxygen level of at least two parts per million. 0.85, that is not good. Nope. At the surface, we find less than one. The further we drop, the less oxygen remains. Uh, 0.3 at five feet, and we'll drop her down to seven feet. By the time we reach the bottom, oxygen is completely gone. Like say this year, it's like all the stars aligned for winter kill because you got real thick ice, the ice got on early, we got big snowfalls, sunlight, sun can't penetrate through to, to get the plants to produce oxygen. Plants without sunlight die. As they decompose, they burn up remaining oxygen. The decomposition and the fish breathing, it uh, causes the oxygen levels to drop down to levels where uh, fish, fish can't live. The results can be hard to stomach. Below the ice, fish struggle to find whatever oxygen remains. Winter kill taking hold, DNR officials open this lake to liberalize fishing, and the scene quickly turns into a mad dash to scoop what's left. It's, it's, it's crazy. really bummed. It's an awesome fishery. This year, Winterkill has claimed dozens of Minnesota lakes. The joys of ice out 
hampered by a nasty smell. But hope remains. Much like a forest fire, winter kill wipes out a lake only to bring it back stronger and better than before. It, it can actually be a blessing. It can reset the food chain, you know, the, from the zooplankton to the, you know, the phytoplankton to the zooplankton. Very seldom will all fish die in a winter kill situation. The strong survivors signal the start of the next generation, a population that grows faster and larger. Usually, you know, 50 to 100 pair is about all it takes. In many cases, DNR officials can boost the rebound and add new species. Soon, a healthy balance is restored and fish populations thrive. Maybe winter kill should be called the Great Balancing Act. After all, there's no better way to describe something so terrible that brings forth so much life. Yeah, it's Mother Nature, that's it's the great equalizer. And our Minnesota Bound Classic this week deals with morel mushrooms and how to find them. Don't go into the woods without Digger the Mushroom well, Guy. the right way to do it. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Jesse Trouble Foundation Systems and Safe Basements Waterproofing, Grand Rapids Tourism, and by the Minnesota Agricultural Water Resources Coalition. Our Minnesota Bound Classic this week is about the morel mushroom. The hunt will soon be beginning. Maybe it already has. Morels can be mysterious fungi. But there's one guy out there who seems to know it all. His name, the Digger. Yeah, you know, I hunt spots, and every good morel mushroom hunter does that. For Tom Anderson, nicknamed Digger, the coming of spring means love is not in the air. We just ain't seeing them yet, but I can smell them. But hiding in the woods. When the lilacs are in bloom, uh, the morels are out. Moral of the story, pun intended, follow Digger. There's another one, I think. Yep, that's a morel. And he is hidden so good. For Digger, a diamond in the rough would not be as sweet or as tasty. And then back in the bag for dinner tonight. Spring, it's been said, is when life's alive in everything. This is especially true in Minnesota's woodlands in April and May, if you know what to look for. Well, I love morels. I've been doing this for 35 years. I've hunted morels in uh, 12 states, follow them all over the country, have over the years. To love a morel, truth be told, is to love a fungi. Who knew? And after tasting one, who cares? While veteran morel hunters tend to be very secretive, on this day, Digger has agreed to be a, well, a mushroom hunting coach. Look all the way down to the... Oh, I see one. You see one? Where? Okay, but don't move your feet. Here, use my stick to mark it with so we don't forget where it is. That's perfect. See any more there? Get that yellow green nail dirty. Oh, it is hollow. Yep. For his mushroom hunting students, Digger has one hard and fast rule. Well, yeah, you, you always tell them where you're not getting them. <laughs> Hunter, morel hunters are the biggest liars in the world. Secrecy is for a reason. Well, no, I'm not going to tell you. I mean, you know, but if I ever catch you on my woods, you'll go to jail. It's as simple as that. They're out there. You just got to get your butt out of the vehicle and go look for them. So go forth one and all. When the lilacs bloom, you too could become a digger. And I love it every year. I pick the dickens out of them. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I, I tasted my first morel mushroom a long, long time ago, and it never gets old, all right? Long live the digger. That about does it for us. Remember, introduce a kid to the great outdoors, maybe take him hunting morel mushrooms. I'm Ron Sharon, of course, always the star of the show, and I wish he would hunt morel mushrooms, is Raven, right? The way I am. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433.
For more information on these stories and more, catch us on the web at mnbound.com.